Richard, and thank you again, everybody, for coming uh, on a cold Tuesday night. Really appreciate it. I'm surprised that we've got such a big audience. So thank you very much. Um, it's always a pleasure to come to Orange. It's a shame that I'm here so briefly. Uh, I think it was, I was just saying, I think it was 2010 that I had a show in uh, the regional gallery here with my partner Bernard Ollis, and it was uh, an exhibition called Tales from the City, which was a travel show of different places. I'm, as as um, Richard just mentioned, I do a lot of travel, so uh, that was I had that show there where um, Alan Sisley himself was uh, involved in curating that exhibition, which was a great experience. Unusually, haven't done anything but art for my whole life. So at school, I was the illustrator for school magazines and drama productions and things like that. I was the only person in my school at, at that time who, had, who didn't do maths or science for the HSC, just I was only interested in English and art. So besides painting, which I now have lived in entirely from painting for quite a long time, um, I taught in originally in little community centres and evening classes and things like that, and I was also an artist model. These were little part-time jobs to rate, you know, so that I could live. As an artist, it's a bit scary to give up what I had, the last teaching position I had, which was. 13, 14 years ago, a long time ago, and that was a half-time position at the National Arts School. It's kind of the dream job as an artist because you only work two and a half days a week, the rest of the time you can paint. I do live entirely from painting. A lot of people who say they live from painting, someone else is paying the rent, the mortgage, the whatever. No, I really do live entirely from painting, which is rare, and a shame, unfortunately, in the arts, all the arts, it's, um, it's rare to be able to make a living, but you know I'm lucky enough to be in that position. So what I do all the time is I'm, I'm always either painting or, as I've been saying, doing things associated with it, which in some cases is various types of admin or organising careers or bringing out, you know, packaging an exhibition or whatever. But it's really that's and I, that is all I do, and it's pretty much seven days a week. Now, as an artist, you don't need to have an enormous studio, but you know you can paint if you want. Like I'm sure that there are some of you who, who do paint. If you really want to do it, you will do it, and you will even if that means doing it on the kitchen table, or if it means working on a small scale or work, working in watercolor or something, you will do it. It's not an excuse not to do it. Uh, however, and I've had various studios, but. I have, this is my studio, and my partner Bernard has a studio adjoining this, and these are two big warehouses in St Peter's in inner Sydney, and uh, it's fantastic because it does mean that I can work on a whole exhibition and see it all at the same time. Okay, I was incredibly lucky to have put a work into the uh, Sulman Prize, I've, I've been in it the year before. But the Sullivan Prize, where the uh, iconic Australian artist Albert Tucker was the judge, they have one artist judges the Sullivan Prize, by the way, which runs concurrently with the Archibald, one different artist each year. And he didn't obviously know me from a bar of soap. And I won that with this painting, um, which is called Black Sun Morning Tonight. That was. Um, also, so I won that, but also just coincidentally at that same time, I also won a scholarship to go overseas for the first time. There's nothing like seeing the real thing. You know, as supporters of Orange Art Gallery, you know, the original gallery here, seeing something online, seeing it in a reproduction, it's never the same. And, and, it, and no matter how wonderful technology is, it's not the same. And uh, so me going and looking at galleries in Europe for the first time was really wonderful. In 1995 now, so now I'm in my mid-30s, I won the Portuguese uh, Prize. It's a, it's a portraiture prize, it's a women's portraiture prize. This is based on a French painter called El El uh, Elizabeth Labiguiar, who was 
same time as Marie Antoinette, in fact, actually painted her. So it's that sort of thing, and painted a big a picture of her wearing a big hat, sort of hat they wore in those days, and a huge big dress, like a, it was not a crinoline, but that type of huge wide dress. And it was a plea for women artists, and it was a painting of her as a successful woman herself as an artist, and two young girls from that time looking over her shoulder and saying that women could paint too. And so I, this is a, my take on that. In 1996, um, I won the Archibald Prize with this painting, which is called um, Self-Portrait as Diana of Erskineville. Now, I live in Erskineville, which is a, I still live there. It's an inner city suburb of Sydney near Newtown. So it's, you know, not that far from Central and Sydney University and all of that. You don't know Sydney very well. But in this painting, where I, oh, I can actually point, that's right, that's one of these pointy things. Yes, so that is, so Diana, is the, she's a Roman version of Artemis, which is goddess of the hunt, and she's a moon goddess. So she usually has, like I've done, a moon on her head. She has, those are like quill of, um, they're paintbrushes, but they're, they're like also supposed to be like bows and like arrows, from bows and arrows, there's a bow. There's actually a version of a painting by Titian of Diana. And so I'm doing myself as, and she's a goddess of the hunt, which is why I'm wearing that leopardy zebra <laughs> animal print, whatever the hell that is. Um, and uh, so I'm making a comment about us as an artist having to be brave and a warrior, and you know, it's, it, it's a bit tongue in cheek. It also relates, I have to say, a bit to some of the paintings that I saw when I was in Europe of paintings by Gainsborough Reynolds and, and uh, people like that, which is 18th century paintings of wealthy people surrounded by attributes and things they own and things. So they have, you know, the Duke of somebody or other with all these things that he bought on the grand tour, and it's a bit like one of those. Winning the Archibald didn't lead directly to other things, but it really helped. Now, one of these things is in the centre of Sydney, if you're there next time in Sydney and you feel like doing this, you can go to the swimming pool complex, which is between St Mary's Cathedral and the Natural History Museum. It's kind of underneath, it's sort of, there's unfortunately, there's a big area with boys on skateboards going up and down. Underneath that is a swimming pool, pool complex. And these are my paintings which um, go along by the pool. So. Well, you can't, you actually can't, like that's where you, that's where the, they're flush with the edge of the um, pool. So you can't actually walk up to them and look. You can see them from, this is shot, actually I can point there. This is shot for the equivalent of there, this, uh, this photo, or from the other side of the pool. And one of the interesting things about making them, which I did, this is commissioned by the City of Sydney, and I'm painting them in this big warehouse, as you see there. Um, and you can see it's good to see that because you can see how big I am compared to them. I think they are the biggest permanent mural painted by one artist possibly in Australia. I'm not sure, possibly. They're painted, for anyone who's interested in that, they're painted on a fiberglassy backing that was selected by the um, architects. And it's painted with very good quality uh, artist acrylic paint, which is called Matisse Acrylic Paint. It's a brand. Um, and they're on the subject of a, an incredible woman who is Australian called Annette Kellerman, who was born in the 1880s, suffered from either polio or rickets, they say different things, as a child, and had to wear calipers. And then someone who was surprisingly enlightened for that time said, I think you should swim to strengthen your legs. And not only did her legs become strong, but she became a champion swimmer. She also became uh, a vaudeville star, a person who I guess kind of started synchronized, not synchronized swimming, yeah, no, is it called, yeah, synchronized swimming, movies made about her, and a silent movie star, which is what that panel is and was apparently either the first person or one of the first people to appear nude 
in a movie, which was about 1916, where she had really long hair and she was walking like that, with a covering as a mermaid. Um, so that's that's actually that's still there. This is this is 1998, so it's a long time ago, and it's still there. That's the fiberglassy uh, things that I'm working on in the uh, warehouse. Oh, good. That shows you. It's good just to see the scale. It's good to have me there. We always think that the figures in the paintings are our size. Whereas actually, as you can see, I'm kind of, maybe I'm even a little smaller than her, but I might be her size, I'm not sure. But I certainly am not the size of those people. So I had a commission from the Australian Memorial in 1999 to 2000 uh, as an Australian official war artist. And it's not something you can apply for. So they rang me up and asked me if I would go to East Timor. Now, East Timor had just voted from independence from Indonesia, and there'd been terrible massacres and re destruction, and re you know, repercussions, terrible, horrific, after they voted to be independent. And peacekeeping forces came in to try and stop any more violence from, from happening. And that was led by the Australian Army. And they had only just really reinvigorated the scheme of sending artists. Now it's an interesting idea, like why would you send artists? It seems weird that you would send artists because, you know, people have all got cameras or phones or, you know, like people could record. It's not like 200 years ago or 100 years, even 100 years ago, but certainly 200 years ago, where you need artists to draw. But what they want is a very, they want a subjective viewpoint. Now, of course, photography is still subjective, what you choose to take, of course it is. But, as an artist, you can be even more so, I suppose. Uh, and uh, it, it was really, it was an incredible honour to be asked. And so, there had been all these massacres in September 99, and in December, I went in and uh, I, coming into Delhi Harbour, which is where I am there, it's what I was wearing. I was wearing khaki, not wearing camouflage like soldiers. This is a man called Cameron Simpson who was my bodyguard, but was also a person to help organise things for me because I haven't a clue what's going on. And I'm wearing camouflage, which shows that I'm a defence civilian, which means I'm with them, but I'm not one of them, which is why I could have red lipstick, messy hair, and no rifle. Um, also, look, it's very interesting that just there you see, on my arms here, is a special flash that says Australian Official Artist, which is really quite amazing. And that's the same uh, thing that artists in the past used to have. Um, you know, people from the Second World War and so on. And what I have there is some charcoal and sketchbooks, and I'm drawing there too in, in, um, on, in sketchbooks with charcoal. If you're interested in this, the Australian War Memorial has some work of mine permanently on display, but they also have a fabulous digitised website where you can look it up and you can look at lots of images. You can also, if you're in Canberra, you can also make an appointment to um, go and have a look at things if you want to. I've been watching television to try and find out what it like, was like before I went, and you keep seeing all these images of streets with rubble and burnt out houses, and I thought, okay, well maybe bits of it look like that, but no, coming in on this ship, it's a double hulled catamaran, it's like a big ship, and there are beautiful green lush mountains, and palm trees, and church steeples, Portuguese style because it was Portuguese and it looks pretty idyllic but then getting out of the port, destruction everywhere, it wasn't just a few places, it was shocking and devastating driving through the streets and um, seeing what had happened. And I was drawing literally from morning to night, I was drawing, you know, from literally people having breakfast right the way through, everything I saw. Before I went, I thought I'm going to make big, important, major paintings that sum up the situation. And then I realised well, that would be 
really, I mean, not just pretentious, but also stupid, because how do I know what the situation is? I don't know, I'm just coming in briefly like that. Now, where this is, this is, this is a town down south, which I'm not sure if you pronounce it, Swai or Suai, I hear it pronounced both ways. And this um, church, it's a very weird looking church, it was an, I couldn't understand what had happened to it, but it's actually an unfinished church, they're building it. Strange looking church. And when the East Timorese had voted for independence, a whole lot of the village people, these people that you see there, East Timorese, ran into the church to escape from the militia who were killing people and burning their houses. And also nuns and priests ran in there, but the militia came in and there was a terrible massacre of, I kept hearing different amounts of people, but so many people were killed. I'm not sure what's happened to this church, whether they've decided, like, do you keep this unfinished as a memorial? Do you finish? Do you finish it to say, um, you know, I will finish it regardless? Or do you, what do you do? I'm not sure what they did. But anyway, it's a very, very poignant and dramatic thing. It's still, I'm sure, but certainly while I was there. And uh, I did many drawings of it and I did many paintings of it and that's one of my quick charcoal drawings. That's one of the paintings I did when I came back of that church. One of the, uh, I think, best comments, one of the really great comments that someone's ever said about my work was when I was in East Timor, there was a soldier, and it wasn't this, it was a drawing, a drawing, a bit like the one I just showed you, but not that one. He's looking at my drawing and I thought, oh, he's about to tell me, oh, because I distorted it. Yes, I, I wanted to make sure it looked like that church. And I thought he was going to say, oh, it's not like, that's taller than that, it's not that many windows or whatever. But he said, that's just what it feels like. And that is actually what, I wanted to be that church, but I also want to show how I felt, what it felt like to me. And this is um, some of the East Timorese people and the Australian army around them. Um, that's some of the East Timorese with these green sticks that they were holding up. That is actually, this is not a very good slide, that's not the fault of the slide projector. That's actually green, it's pale green, not white. Looks a bit like zinc cream, it should not should look like green light on them. They were holding that. Uh, and there's actually that church in the background. This is what I did when I came back in, in gouache, which I said is like um, watercolour. It's quite a large work. I'm sure. And I've also done, I've done a lot of work with theatre. I've done work with the Australian Opera, the Australian Ballet, the commissions to do work with ballet. Um, and, um, and I've also done other things, as, which we will talk about, as we mentioned in the title, burlesque drag shows, every type of theatre. So circus stars, so high and low in theatre, whatever in theatre. These are some quick charcoal drawings of uh, Firebird rehearsals, Graham Murphy's version of Firebird that I had a commission from Art Centre Victoria to do. So there's, these are quick sketches done from life from the dancers. I mean, it's fantastic going to rehearsals. Rehearsals are the most interesting because you they're actually changing it and they're discussing things and you know Watching how something's made is so fascinating. I mean, I'm always interested in how any kind of artist arrives at Anything at yeah, what they do, you know, whether obviously as a, as a visual artist, but as a in terms of writing or, comp or, or music or anything, how do you arrive at the finished product? Well, fascinating to watch something where it's a group of people, not just one person like me. So, I first, I've been to Antarctica twice, and uh, the first time was in 2012, and there's different residencies, some of the ones that, um, Richard mentioned that I haven't showed you like residencies in Mexico and Egypt and China and so on. I haven't put in those because it would take up too much time. Some of those things I've applied for and other those other things I've just I've been lucky enough to have offered to me, like the both like the thing with the pool mural and the um, East Timor. This one was also offered to me, and if I'd like to go on that, the Aurora Australis, 
which is um, a big, it's not, a, as you can probably guess from the look of it, it's not a tourist vessel, it's an Australian government vessel. And I was on the ship for six weeks, the only artist with scientists. And it was a fascinating experience to be in, in that world. And they were doing various tests to see you know, terrible things that's happening to the environment, like the amount of acid that's growing in our water and global warming and so on, which is really terrible in the, everywhere, but obviously more clearly in the, in the Arctic and the, and the Antarctic and no doubt in the Arctic. Um, and that's me wearing my regulation Australian Antarctic outfit. And they are some wonderful penguins. Now they are a daily penguins, they're called. There's all different types of penguins I now know because I've been now twice to Antarctica I and mean, a different way the other time. These are little ones, as you see. They're really curious. You're not allowed to go up to them, but if you sit down and lie around like these scientists are doing, they come up to you. And they're very curious. There's not in this sense that that's a, you know, a snowman that they, the scientists built, but some, some of these scientists also built an igloo, perfect igloo, because they think, oh, let's just do this. And penguins, for us to go in, you have to go like that, go like that to go in. But penguins would just walk in, see what's that, and then walk out. They're very curious and they were, they were absolutely wonderful. And it was an incredible experience. Uh, and it really is like going to another planet. I mean, it's a cliche to say that, but it, it truly is.